salvation is here. You are watching this video for a reason. No matter what you've gone through, no matter what you fear, your decisions from this point forward will bring you the answers that will be unleashed. I am Olympia LaPointe. No matter what you've gone through, no matter what you fear, no matter your situation, you can always find success for yourself and attract the life that you want. The key is deciding to reprogram your mind. Now, it's not easy, but it can be 100% done. I know, I did it myself. I'm a rocket scientist. I helped launch 28 NASA missions to space and wrote the books Mathophobia, how you can overcome your math fears and become a rocket scientist, Answers Unleashed, the science of unleashing your brain's power, and my latest book, Answers Unleashed 2, the science of attracting what you want. And I have developed a new type of science, it's thought science, the tree brain theory of relativity. And it's from my space knowledge and my personal experiences to help you unlock the power of your mind. In my youth, I experienced severe poverty, failing grades, emotional, physical, sexual abuse. I had to find a way to reprogram my brain to overcome toxic thinking and fear. My future self was banking on me to have the faith for a better tomorrow and to listen to the inner parts of myself who knows the truth. You have inner parts to yourself who knows the truth too. As a result, on TV, in my books, and on stages across the world, I show the process of unleashing your brain's power. Now, are you ready? Today, your answers will be unleashed. One out of 31,000. I gasped in shock when I first saw that number. It was 1993. I was a freshman college student at California State University, Northridge, and our English professor decided to give us the probabilities of young African-American students do you know what that number means? Do you, do you know? Raise your hand. Raise your hand right now. Everyone raise your hand. Now look around the room. Do you see the number of people who has their hands raised? And look all the way in the back, too. Now multiply that number by six. Now, imagine all those people that you see, one that stands out. Well, that one person that stands out is myself. You see, one out of 31,000 represented the probability of a young African-American female getting a PhD in the natural sciences or mathematics or becoming a rocket scientist. Now, uh, I didn't get a PhD in mathematics. I'm Olympia LaPointe, and I became a rocket scientist. I am a rocket scientist, author, and presenter who helps you unleash your brain power, specifically I helped launch great, great machinery into space using mathematics and science. I use mathematics and science to calculate the probability of catastrophic explosions within flight. I use SAS products to do it. I use statistics, Bayesian approach, bootstrapping method, ANOVA, regression of modeling. These sound familiar to you? Well, it was what we used in order to launch this, the Space Shuttle Program. Now, the Space Shuttle Program consisted of the solid rocket boosters, which as you see in right, the orange external tank, as well as the vehicle itself. And my role was specifically for the Space Shuttle main engines. Now, to give you an idea of what that looked like, 
I'm going to show you this. Now, this picture doesn't even do it justice. Do you know that the space shuttle main engine was at least two stories tall? I was so thankful to work on this and, and work on it with great people. And my role was to do several things. One was to make sure that our engine testing was successful. They could not test the engine without my reliability and safety systems signature. This signature verified that everything was checked out OK so we could test successfully and human lives would be saved. And I sat in the mission control room supporting the launch. This is a picture of the Rosk room. And it was great to sit in that room. Oh, I remember the statistics that we'd see running across the board for 12 hours straight. And we had to know where every number was. And this now is an exhibit at the California Science Museum in Los Angeles. That's my seat that's an exhibit. <laughs> I get excited just looking at it. Now, we're here to do great things. We're here to create innovation, think outside the box, know how we can do great things. But innovation and your breakthrough depends on one specific thing. One thing that is so crucial. Now, in my books, Mathophobia, How You Can Overcome Your Math Fear and Become a Rocket Scientist, and Answers Unleashed, The Science of Unleashing Your Brain's Power, and my latest book that's going to come out soon, Answers Unleashed 2, The Science of Attracting What You Want, I talk about the importance of this one main thing. You know what it is? Your decisions. Your decisions. Specifically, your decisions help you rewire your brain, and it helps you understand how to beat the odds so you become the outlier. You become that one. There's no accident to becoming the innovative person. There's no accident to innovation. It is a decision. And it's not always an easy one. But your job is to make that decision so it happens. Now, there's a whole lot of reasons why innovation doesn't happen, especially in the technology and, and STEM world, the science, technology, engineering, mathematics. There's a whole lot of reasons why technology and innovation doesn't happen. And so today, I'm going to present to you some three key issues with statistics that will show us the, the, the difficulties and the blocks that we sometimes face. And I'm going to share not the reason, but my personal story to help you understand the importance of that decision and a solution for each one of the issues so we each can move forward in such a profound way that we together can create innovation and that breakthrough. <laughs> you know, this is an issue. Do you know this is an issue? Nearly 50% of college students studying STEM, that's science, technology, engineering, mathematics, leave the field or they drop out. Did you know that? Did you, did you know that? Well, people, uh, people always think that Olympia LaPointe, you always became a great rocket scientist and you were trained to become that. No! Can I just tell you, I failed algebra, <laughs> I failed uh, geometry, I failed calculus, and I, uh, I failed chemistry. Did I, did I just tell you that? I know. I know you're like, what? <laughs> People are surprised. If you've watched my TED talk, Reprogramming Your Brain to Overcome Fear, you know this. You know that I got tutoring from a math teacher, and the math teacher helped me retake the classes over, and because I gained that confidence that I could finally understand mathematics, and finally overcome that fear that I could become a rocket scientist. You know that story. But I'm going to tell you the backstory. Now, this backstory isn't necessarily too pleasant, but it's the truth. See, I had to make a decision to get to that place where I was going to 
decide to learn. And uh, the truth is, I grew up in severe poverty. And um, it wasn't too great. Uh, it was in the middle of South Central Los Angeles. Uh, there was gang violence everywhere. There were crack houses right next door. Uh, we didn't have any money. And I remember having to make a decision. We were in complete poverty in the middle of the United States. And uh, I went to the grocery store and I had to make a decision. Do I buy toilet paper or do I buy paper for school? And not only that, I was hungry. And I remember going into this grocery store, getting the tissue, and I walked past this box of cereal bars. Now, I never had money to eat breakfast to go to school, and here were cereal bars. And I looked at the cereal bars. And I'm going to be honest with you. That moment in time, I thought about taking the cereal bars and taking it without paying for it. I was that desperate. I was so hungry. And I remember I picked up the cereal bars and I looked at it. I realized I didn't, I didn't want to live my life that way. I didn't want to live in poverty, and I didn't want to take a $3.53 box of cereal bars. And at that moment in time, I prayed to God. I said, God, God, show me something different. Show me something so I can see the value of my life. I did something big. In faith, I, I put the box down and I walked out. <laughs> and I even forgot the toilet tissue. <laughs> and I walked out and I decided I'm not, I'm going to do anything, anything, anything I can to change that. Show me the value of my life. See, at that moment, that decision of leaving that, leaving it behind, and going off into something in which I had no idea what to expect, but to have faith, and in science, faith, when you apply it, is innovation. It is creating something that you see, but you don't know how to do it yet, but you decide to invent it and bring it into reality. And at that moment in time, I decided not to live in poverty, but to find the value of my life. And I asked for just a vision to see myself in a way that was going to change my life. And then two weeks later, our math teacher says, anybody who'd like to come to tutoring during the winter break, I'll volunteer my time so the tutoring will be free. It was like a miracle. So what did I do? I asked to borrow a dollar thirty-five each way to catch the bus two hours, to sit with him for one hour for math tutoring every single day for 30 days. And that, my friends, is the decision that changed my life. When you go home, I want you to remember this. You must decide to rewire your brain to overcome whatever it is that you have experienced, whatever fear it is, by envisioning yourself in a better future, in your better future. Because, my friend, you are the person who brings innovation to this world. Now, once you decide to actually remove fear, you got to actually place yourself in supportive environments in order for the, the, the 
the ability for your frontal brain lobes to work. Now let me break this down for you. When you experience fear, the reptilian part of the brain fires and your frontal brain lobes, which is your executive mind, completely shuts off. But as soon as you make a decision, fear turns off and your frontal brain lobe opens up and you are able to make decisions. About. So by making decisions, each time you turn off fear. But in order to keep your brain rewired, you must place yourself in supportive environments so that dopamine actually transforms your hard wiring of your brain, if you will. But what happens if you're not in a supportive environment? Now, I worked all this way, graduated from California State University, Northridge, at the top of my class in mathematics with the application of statistics. Can you believe that? And I was hired by a company. And if you know anything about the movie Hidden Figures, you know the difficulties in which these uh, real life stories of these African American women faced when they were in the space race in the 1960s. Well, my experience 30 years later in the space world wasn't exactly pleasant. Do you know that an issue is that women leave the technical industry? at a rate of 45% higher than men? Huh. Do you know that? See, I didn't know that. When I first started, I had no clue about any of that. Uh, I would be lying to you if I said it was easy for me to become a rocket scientist. If anything, it was harder for me to maintain myself sane in the rocket science environment than it was in South Central Los Angeles. Uh, I would be lying to you if I told you that I didn't experience racism. For example, I remember going out to my car not once, not twice, not three times, four times to see my car keyed with a racial slur. What do you do? Well, the only thing I could do, tell my manager, have security walk me out every night, and continue to show up to do the job. I would be lying if I told you I didn't experience sexism. Uh, for example, I remember working on a project for six months doing extensive research, going through reams and reams of data, and finally figuring out the answer. And then having a manager come to me two weeks before the presentation and said that he would prefer a male to give it, not a woman. What do you do? Well, in my case, I went to my mentor and my coach. God, got a way to be able to politely tell him no and give it anyway. Fortunately, he came back later to apologize because he realized he was wrong and the presentation was the best that they had seen in 20 years. You see, at that moment, I made a decision that I was not going to let an environment who wasn't used to having a person like me there, I was not going to allow the environment to impact me, but rather, I was going to impact it. And in the process of doing so, I recognized that women's brains and men's brains are completely different. You know that? For example, uh, women not only can think logically with the left side of their brain, but they actually can use the right side of the brain with communication. And so I found that out when I was working as a rocket scientist. The way that I could help as a woman in that environment was not only to solve things mathematically, but to explain it to every single person on the team, even when the teams didn't necessarily in their cross or connect with one another, I could explain the reasoning behind certain calculations so everyone could be on board. And it created innovation, it created teamwork, it created a gigantic, program to be able to ask what they can do next to create innovation. And this led us to winning $55 million in engine contract awards. And I was honored because I became the modern day technology leader, engineer of the year. Sometimes you must decide to listen to women, to minorities, and most importantly, people who do not think like you. Because you know why? They hand you innovation on a platter. 
Now, I, I, love, uh, I love telling you stories, obviously. And a lot of people are not aware of this. Uh, this next issue is something in which we all can figure something out. Uh, there's an issue, uh, according to AARP, over 60% of Americans, 55 or over, have experienced discrimination in the workplace. Do you know that? And then on top of it, people ages 20 to 24 experience the highest rate of unemployment in the United States at 13.2%. This is according to labor statistics. Now, people are unaware that when I first started working as a rocket scientist, I was 21 years old. Now, that was uh, over 20 years ago, like almost uh, 22 years ago. Yeah, wow. And uh, when I first started, <laughs> it was hilarious. Uh, I first started, I was 21, and I looked at these people who were about to retire, and I thought in my head, what do they know about innovation? And then they looked at me, this young kid coming into the rocket science world, what does she know about rockets? Do you know what the truth was? We both didn't know. We both were making assumptions, and we both were not listening to one another. And I had a manager, thank God for him, uh, Steve Hobart, he is, shout out to Steve Hobart, he is now a major vice president at an aerospace company now. And he was uh, my manager, and he was also someone who mentored me uh, daily. And I remember going to him and telling him, I, I, I just, <laughs> I, I don't know what to do. My job depends on getting them to understand how to design this failure out, and they're not listening. And he looked at me, and he says, Olympia, have you ever thought about just interviewing them and just asking them questions? Here's your assignment. I'd like you to go and interview every single person that you're supposed to give a solution to. I'm like, what? Just try it out. So that's what I did. I went and I sat and I listened. I asked them, how did they go into that environment? How did they know to create the nozzle in a certain way? What did they know about the ISP and how the horsepower could increase? Why was there a, a difficulty within using kerosene versus a hydrogen base and oxidizer? combination. <clears throat> the information that I received was priceless. And at the same time, they listened to me. And they said, well, we didn't know that this could be an issue. Well, we didn't know that if we use this particular type of fuel, there will be a potential explosion. Let's call the other guys to listen to you so they can hear what you bring to the table. So together, we found answers as a team. See, when you decide to invest in genius minds at any age, together, you bring innovation. Now, that story, um, very thankful, because we created a way with we invent sequence diagrams to be able to predict the future with accuracy using not only engineering, but also statistics. What do you do to invest in the people who are about to retire? Do you have any type of video programming archived at your companies to capture their information? What do you do to mentor somebody young who is brilliant but doesn't know the answer yet? You see, I ask you these questions because I don't have the answers. You do. You see, your brain works in such a profound way that your answer is going to come in such great timing. 
that you will not only see the statistic, but it won't mean anything to you because you're going to redefine it. <laughs> I love sharing all this with you. If there's one thing that you take away from this, is to recognize that innovation isn't sticking to what you've known. It isn't sticking to fear. It isn't sticking to only listening to the people in which you're used to listening to. And it isn't thinking that you have all the answers and people of a certain generation don't. No. It is about understanding that you can rewire your brain to overcome fear and see a new future for yourself and other people. It's called innovation. You can listen to people who do not think like you, who do not look like you, do not see things the same way as you. And you can invest in knowledge and capture it so everyone will be able to see decades from now. You never know. If you make all of these decisions within your life and within your company and with your opportunities, you never know. You may be one out of 31,000. I am Olympia LaPointe. For more tips, you're welcome to visit AnswersUnleashed.com. And you can always find me here. It has been my pleasure to speak with you today.